I've done this right. It's weird that I have to like learn how to do this every week. But in theory, oh, I see the problem. I put astronomy cast. This is not astronomy cast. This is the weekly space hangout. Uh, there we go. Everything's better. There. All right. Ah, now I fix it. I knew there was something that I hadn't done. Uh, hey, everybody. Go ahead and say hello to me, to us. Hello. And then, and then I will, <laughs> and then I will be able to say everybody's names. This is weird. Do you know what? Like you randomly change the font size on your browser somehow. And then you don't know how to un... <laughs> like you brushed over the wrong yeah, button you just, or something yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. Except I'm looking and F12. the <laughs> and the font size is correct, and yet everything is teeny tiny, and I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And what's it, worse it, is I when your know. cat finds something in the yeah. browser and you can't figure out yeah. what it was. Yeah. Or I've, but it's. Or I fig figured out how to do something in Photoshop, and then a year later, I don't remember how I did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or they've um, taken it away in the next update. Yeah, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. Hello to Astro B, Ben Kalo, Beth Johnson, Bob Moeller, Brian Thomas, Corey S, David Fairweather, Harry Patrick, Ian Farkron, James Platt, Johnny J, Johnny Z, Julie Hammond, Larry Beckham, uh, Larry King, Lillian Brennan, Luke Duke, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Rich Wilson, Uncle Bill Druin, Wayne Francis, Zach Perry, and Zap Fan Zap Fan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a absolutely normal episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Nothing to see here. Uh, oh, there you go. Someone's saying control mouse wheel. Hmm. All right, let me try that. Nope. That just changed everything else. That's it's so it's super weird. <laughs> All right. Um, what else is happening? <laughs> it's like it's like it's like we're all just like we don't even want to talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah, There's nothing so. to see here. Nothing to see here. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? You're I'm catching gonna... me in the morning, Fraser. I was out. Uh, I was out. Uh, you know, drinking. What what time, what time is it there for you? Uh, nine in the morning. Oh, this is perfect. Then this is good. Yeah. This is yeah. This yeah. Is no, it works out. Yeah, the timing. Where yeah? Where I was are you at? To be really early. I'm in Taiwan. Oh, okay. okay. I miss that conversation. So, yeah, yeah. I've been there very briefly. Right now. I was there mm, very briefly back in the nineties. Mm, yeah, love it here. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm I, I'm super stoked. That's the the <laughs> we're just we're talking about our our uh, learning Mandarin uh, journeys, and yeah, I've tried to watch a couple of Mandarin shows in from Taiwan, and I like the plots and the. Um, like no censorship. So they're good shows, right? As opposed to the stuff that comes from mainland China, which is, you know, censored pretty hard. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Taiwanese accent is really rough to understand. It is, yeah. It's a completely different mm -hmm. accent. I mean, it's totally. still the same language. Right. Yeah. I just, I have to get my ear used to it. You know, I was training yeah. myself with, uh, yeah, Beijing dialect, basically. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I'm doing the mm -hmm. same. And so, yeah, I think at some point you have to, um, find another, I don't know, just, just immerse in only Taiwanese stuff. But yeah, I think a shopkeeper even told me that I sounded like I was from Beijing when I was, <laughs> when I was talking to her. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's the... <laughs> and so where are you? Are you teaching? Are you at the university? I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, Academia Sinica. It's the, basically the National Academy of Taiwan. Um, but my office is located right at uh, National Taiwan University. So fabulous place to be it's still like the university vibe but yep. it's all a, a purely a research institute that's awesome and are you yeah it's a great place i i mean do they know about some exomoons uh well you know the thing about working in exomoons is there are very few of us uh working in it so you know i can pretty much do this job wherever you know and if i have collaborators they're going to be all around the world so basically i just work wherever somebody wants to <laughs> give me a job <laughs> and it's here for the time being so I'm, I feel very privileged uh, that they've given me the opportunity. That's um, the postdoc life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
All right, uh, I'm gonna put you all back into single boxes. There's me uh, from my intro, and here we go. All right, hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're gonna be talking about the discovery of an Earth mass rogue planet. Uh, more, uh, or what is the total number of habitable planets, according to Kepler? Uh, a new comet in the sky, and what's up with phosphine in Venus? Wah, wah. Uh, spoiler alert. <clears throat> so joining me this week on my screen, I've got uh, Alex Cicci. Alex, welcome back. Thank you, Fraser. It's great to be here. And for people who uh, are catching up, Alex, you're in Taiwan now. That's correct. Just got here about a month and a half ago. Something yeah. like that. And the yeah. uh, and of course for you it's nine in the morning. I guess the time the time zone caught everybody unawares, right? Uh, yeah, I'm thirteen hours thirteen hours ahead of the East Coast. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. And so, uh, but it's like perfect timing for you because it's like nice morning. You've had your coffee and and time to talk some space news. Exactly right. That's awesome. All right, uh, we've got Carolyn Collins Peterson. Carolyn, welcome back. Hey Hi. Good to see you. And now, is your state no longer on fire? Mm, mostly not, although not all the big fires are contained yet. But oh. we have clear skies, so. Oh, that's good. More that's or good. less clear skies, yeah. so that's good. Person yeah. can person can dare take their telescope out and point yeah, at the sky yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, and we get a few clouds now and again. But I look at the horizon, I go, is that a cloud or is that smoke? <laughs> the fire, yeah. Actually, sure. it's, <laughs> it's funny here, now that the fire risk has died down, everyone's doing all their burning. And so, uh, so yeah. it's, you know, all of the, the clearing and burning and stuff. So there's fires all through the forest, but they're all intentional as opposed to the unintentional forest fires that we get all summer. And then well, in the usually, winter time, we get everyone with their, with their uh, wood stoves. So yeah, just everything is always on fire all the time. Well, and usually we were very happy to see snow in October for once. So oh yeah, that yeah. worked well. Yeah, we got on all the mountains, but we haven't actually gotten snow any further down yet. All right, last but not least, we've got Dave Dickinson. David, welcome back. Hey, Fraser. Still uh, here in downtown Norfolk uh, battling light pollution. <laughs> um, so have you have you gotten a chance to get your hands on the new Stellina yet? Have you talked to them at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reviewed it a few months ago. No, I did the, the new EVs. one. The new, the oh, new small no, one. the small one. Well, they're not going to have the review models out for like another um, – like 10 months or so. I did talk to him about that, yes. Oh, okay, okay. But those two look pretty, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see, and the, the price point looks a lot lower on those. Because I had a, an EV scope in a, in a Stellina this uh, summer, and I, I put those through their paces, and it's it's pretty impressive. They're kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I Someone was asking me um, a couple of days ago about this, and I think, like, it's going to change everything. Like, once people yeah. figure out how to make this technology part of every telescope, some kind of Starfinder plate solver. The, the plate solver is amazing. And it's one of the first ones I've ever used that right out of the box, it just worked. Yeah. You literally um, could use it with almost no experience. If you knew how to hook up an app to a smartphone, you could use it. Yeah. So. And so if there could be some kind of plate that fits, or some kind of mount bit that fits in between the telescope mount and the scope that you know performs that same thing, but it can That's work been thought of too, telescope. something yeah. like for an ordinary dumb telescope yeah. that you could have some kind of plate solving software you could hook up and make a smart telescope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just just for pointing and finding, that would be great. Yeah, totally. All right, so uh, before we get into this week's special guest, I want to give a big shout out to our good friends, fans, executive producers at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are the community that uh, surrounds us and uh, tells us what to do. They organize the guests every week. So if you want to be a part of making this show, you should join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Uh, go to wshcrew.space. Uh, they'll teach you how to be an executive producer of the show. They'll give you all the credentials that you require to bring any guest that you want here on the show, and I will interview them for you. So uh, go to wshcrew.space. All right, let's get on to this week's guest. And this week we've got Pranvera Hyseni. Is that right, Pranvera? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I, I mangled it a little bit, but but who are you and what do you do? 
Uh, well, I uh, I am actually currently living here in San Jose in uh, California, currently in Mountain View, actually. But I'm from the Republic of Kosovo, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic about astronomy. And I found that the first astronomy outreach of Kosovo program in our country. So for all of you who don't know where Kosovo is, it's uh, a very small country in Eastern Europe, and it's the youngest country in Europe, actually. And um, it's unfortunately uh, very difficult to um, do astronomy back there because we don't have, you know, uh, any resources uh, to do the science, or if you wanted to have a telescope, you will not find a telescope to buy there. So it was a really uh, great challenge uh, to start a program in a country where you have nothing and starting from zero. So uh, this happened like a few years ago. And I've been trying to work with this program and do activities and educating the public and then started traveling around the world. And yeah, I ended up here in California and now I'm pursuing a master's in planetary science at Santa Cruz University. So, so tell us the story. How did you get um, to be able to, uh, you know, like what was the, how did you get to the point that you wanted to take on this challenge? What, you know, I mean, were well, you just uh, like an astronomy fan and just yeah. wanted a, a way to, to see the night sky? Yeah, as a kid, I, I, you know, I went through a lot because uh, at the time when I was four or five years old, my country was uh, in a war, uh, going through a war, and it was uh, really difficult for my family and for everybody in Kosovo, and uh, not uh, many things were happening, you know, regarding the science or stuff like that. So actually, during the war, there was an eclipse that happened in the sky, and as a kid, I remember seeing that, and it was a nice moment that would take your mind off of the terrible things that were happening and all the genocide and stuff like that. So um, that was a moment that I really appreciated and it really uh, got me the sparkle and got me interested into uh, the sky and the planets and what's going on out there. But, um, you know, being in Kosovo, I was always uh, limited with literature or books. I never had a telescope until I actually learned to speak English and I started using social media like uh, in around 2009, around that time. So I met with people that uh, are, you know, in Europe and they saw that I wanted, you know, to learn more about astronomy. So there was one of the gentlemen who uh, donated me a small telescope. It was just a three inch refractor telescope, but it, it was such a cool tool. It got me started. It was nice to have something like that. And then I was trying to do uh, outreach with a small telescope and you would see a large number of people coming to see the moon or the planets from a very tiny telescope. And that was interesting to other folks out there in America and Europe and Australia when they see like a large number of people trying to see the sky from a telescope of that size. So everybody wanted to join together and uh, send me more equipments. So this way there were a lot of organizations around the world that helped me out and got me started by sending me uh, better devices and telescopes and you know uh, solar telescopes of different wavelengths and mounts and books and atlases or anything that actually an amateur astronomer needs. And I'm very thankful to everybody who wanted to help that because they didn't only help me, but they helped our country because I shared that equipment with everybody. And just after I received all that, uh, I founded the Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo organization for the first time. Our country never had a group or organization or institute or anything like that that had to do with astronomy. And we don't have an observatory. So it's not like, you know, somebody here uh, is getting inspired because because they go to a planetarium and watch a show and it's so amazing and they want to do astronomy. It's a totally different case there. And I wanted that to change. I wanted that the young people to have an opportunity to learn about these things without always having to travel somewhere else. 
So that uh, was amazing. Uh, I formed a team and which consisting of 200 volunteers. Wow. And we go to every group, every school in Kosovo. We try to uh, bring our telescopes, free charge. Uh, we never charge for activities. We go to schools and we show them the planets or the sun or the moon, you know, galaxies. We teach them and, you know, we teach them about the chemistry of the sun. We try to, uh, to let them understand what science is and why is it important to us. And um, I, I did a bachelor uh, in, in geography at University of Pristina. I graduated last year, but I wanted to have, um, you know, a better background at this uh, rather than just doing outreach and teaching others about science. I wanted to have the opportunity to, to give my contribution to the science. So I decided to apply uh, at, uh, at UC Santa Cruz, and unfortunately, I just got admitted, and I started a month ago. I'm loving it, man. It's just all yeah. about planets and stuff. But it's great because this got us started, and right now we're actually working to uh, to make the first observatory in our country. We don't have one, and we're very much putting a hard work. We just received a 14 inch telescope from Celestron, which is going to be the largest telescope in our country. And hopefully we'll be able to build a small building to make a home for the telescope so that our students and our people in Kosovo can come there and learn and observe and uh, get, you know, excited about astronomy because astronomy is for everybody. It's yeah. like sky unifies us all. And, you know, everybody should have the, the opportunity to learn about the stars and why we are in this planet and where we're going and all that stuff. I'm, I'm you know, that that experience of when you show a person a telescope through a telescope for the first time, when you show them like Saturn or the moon, especially Saturn, Saturn's the one that that you just see the light come on in their eyes when they see Saturn for the first time and they can't they can't believe that they're actually seeing the planet that they've seen in the books and they think it's some kind of trick or something. Um, and you have just had a chance to experience that, I'm sure, thousands and thousands of times. You get to be the person who who gets to sort of share that joy with as many people as as possible. It sounds uh, sounds really inspiring. Yeah, it's it's always amazing how uh, people react for the first time when they come up to the telescope and look at that. One of the sad things is that sometimes there are people who see me with my telescope. Sometimes we just go out in the city and set up the equipment so people can come and look by. Sometimes they don't even know what the equipment is for, what we're measuring there, or what we're doing. They have no clue where should they put their eye to look yeah. at because they never had a telescope around or ever seen a telescope in person so it's nice when they come and look in the telescope and actually realize that saturn has a ring for real it's not just in the photos you know in the books and you know they look at the moon for very close for the first time and it's it's an interesting feeling and how they actually uh you know react to that it's awesome and many people after observing in our telescope just decide that hey uh, this is what i want to do i want to join your team i want to learn more about science and we have numerous of these students and young folks who actually have decided to go study physics or any other science because they got inspired from our events. And I'm very proud of that. I mm -hmm. mean, my time that I invested in that, it's worth. It's worth when you see, you know, young people like that. It's it's kind of hard because, I mean, on the one hand, you've got this incredible movement that's going back in Kosovo. And at the same time, you want to focus on your own education as well in the United States and be able to, to sort of build up your education. What's your plan now? Uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a challenge because I had to come here and start studies and leave all my organization behind. But the great thing is that I, I have a wonderful board and they are actually running the organization there right now. And I'm in touch with them uh, like all the time and uh, we talk every day and we make plans uh, we set projects we give talks although right now we're all limited to virtual you know events like that but it's awesome and i'm trying to help them out to spread the word about 
you know, the observatory, because we're looking for funds. We're trying to also convince the government of Kosovo to help us build that uh, that observatory. And actually, you can help us. If somebody wants to, to help, they can just go and go find me and uh, type Kosovo Observatory so they can donate. But this is one thing that I want uh, to, to do. And at the same time, I'm trying to focus on my studies. It, it's definitely a challenge because I'm not having as much time as I used to have. <laughs> yeah. And also, I used to travel a lot and, you know, meet more astronomers and, and go out there and have experience. But I think this is very important for me that I should have, you know, a degree and then as much time as I can to help at the same time my country. Uh, this is what I'm determined to do. And um, I'm very happy to do this. Well, it sounds absolutely incredible, very inspiring. And and so once again, if people want to get involved and support the work that you're doing, um, what should they do? Well, uh, people have been helping us in the past and it's, uh, people have helped us in different ways. Sometimes people just want to donate equipments. There are astronomers who have telescopes that they're not using or eyepieces and they just, uh, send them to us and we don't have enough telescopes. Like in all Kosovo, you could probably find, I would guess 20 telescopes <laughs> in the whole country. So, like as more equipment as we have, it definitely makes a change because mm -hmm. we we can spread them more. We go to more places. It allows us to work and keep the organization alive and the passion alive. So if somebody wants to help, they can help this way. They can help by donating to build the first observatory in the GoFundMe. Or if they want, they can even come and visit us in person when the things go back to normal because we don't get as many scientists and astronomers coming to Kosovo and visiting us. We had two uh, people, two astronomers from America who came to Kosovo and they gave a talk to our students and you have no idea how many participants we had. Even people from the government showed up wow. because it's an unusual thing to have somebody talk to us about science, you know. So it, it's great if somebody wants to visit and just come and interact with our people and, and share some news, you know, share some some research that they have done. That would be awesome. And we would definitely appreciate that. Wonderful. Well, what, what, what are your uh, what are your skies like in Kosovo? Uh, they are fairly dark. Kosovo okay. is a small country and, uh, you know, 20 years ago it was totally destroyed by the war. So we don't have uh, large cities. So okay. we have very wonderful mountains that you can go and uh, see, you know, the sky. So even the place that we chose to build the observatory, we got the property donated. It's a wonderful sky. Oh, wow. That sounds incredible. Well, Pravera, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We're all incredibly inspired. I hope that people do follow up on what you're doing with the observatory and and uh, and follow the research. And when you do set up the observatory, please let us know. We'd love to get a tour when you're there. Absolutely. Thank you for all having right. me. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. All right, let's move on to this week's news. Uh, Dave Dickinson, you're on my screen right now. So uh, why don't you talk to us about a comet? Yeah, there's. Uh, we've had actually a fairly decent year for comets this year. We've had a good string of binocular comets. And of course, we had F3 Neowise this summer that came by, came by a really good time because most of us were kind of locked down. So we had at least something to uh, observe that was kind of interesting. And that was a good uh, naked eye. One of the best. I saw some really amazing yeah, photos come out of that. Uh, now we have another one that might reach towards six magnitude. I'd say a good binocular comet in the morning sky. Uh, it's uh, 2020 S3 uh, Erasmus. Mm -hmm. This was discovered by Nicholas Erasmus in the Atlas Sky Survey. Uh, I don't know quite why it didn't get an Atlas designation instead of uh, an why they did that, but still. Um, it's visible in November and the time to really see it, it's in the morning sky. It's going toward, it's in the constellation Corvus right now and it's going toward Virgo, uh, right in that area where you have Mercury and Venus. Venus is very bright in the morning sky. It's in that very general direction. And really the time to view it is over the next few weeks uh, before we lose it in the sun's glare. I'm gonna have uh, to once... take, I'm gonna have to take it on faith that there is a planet called Mercury that exists. <laughs> you know, but. Oh, you can you can see Mercury in the morning sky if you know exactly where to look for it right now. It's uh, I think it's at greatest elongation in about a week, so that's the best time to see it. Yeah, uh, when it's separated away. Yeah. So 
and it's all along that same ecliptic plane flying with Venus there in the morning. So if you know exactly where to look for it, you can pick it out. No, no, uh, this the comet... one only time I've ever seen Mercury was in <laughs> was in Australia. So interesting. Yeah. Did you, did you ever catch it on the transit last year? Twenty nineteen. Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. No, okay. No. It wasn't visible over there. I don't think. No, yeah. we. I've got I've got mountains to the east and mountains to the west. So yeah, tra you can catch it on transit. That's kind of cheating, but we don't have a transit. I think till 2035 again now. So I've seen three Mercury transits. Those are always kind of cool. Yeah. But uh, with, with S3 Erasmus, I haven't been able to check this one out yet. We're just getting clear skies now. Uh, binocular Comet looks a little bit maybe like a globular cluster, only that doesn't quite resolve into focus when they're, uh, right now it's at eighth magnitude. And like I said, it's predicted to get up to six magnitude. So that's knocking on uh, naked eye. However, yeah. comets, comets usually got to be a magnitude or two brighter and the reason being like with deep sky objects, you get that magnitude instead of a star where you have that point source, a comet, you've got the magnitude kind of smeared out over an apparent surface area. So I've noticed like with F3 Neowise this summer, once it didn't really appear naked eye till it hit around yeah. second or third magnitude. But I know what Whereas, you mean. It was it was one of those situations where you're looking sort of out of the side of your eye or using your, your yeah. the what is it, the... The rods, the cones, which is it? You're using the. I always have to look it up, but yeah, one, yeah, one yeah, is you're using your, the. It's like fast and slow film. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so you can, and so you can find these objects in the sky, and then you, once you've located, then you can turn your binoculars and actually get a better view yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> And binoculars are really my favorite to look for uh, these types of comets because you can just you have the true view that's not inverted. You've got a wide, generous view. And if you kind of know the article I wrote on Universe Today, what I usually do is I list like where it's near bright stars or where it's near deep sky objects. And you kind of use those as signposts. Like yeah. when it passes near a bright star, find that star, sweep around the field. And then if you see a little fuzzball, you're like, well, there's the comet. So <laughs> yeah. that's usually the easiest way to, to scoop them up. So Terrific. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean... <clears throat> I mean, I feel like getting the Neowise comet earlier this year sort of partially, the universe partially paid back its debt of not yeah. letting us see a bright na it naked wasn't eye quite a hail bop. It wasn't quite a hail bop or hype, no. but it was pretty good. It was okay. You know, it was fine. It was you fine. know, it's ironic. We haven't had a really spectacular comet uh, since we did the switch from film to digital astrophotography. Yeah. Like in the late 90s, yeah. early 2000s. For the Northern Hemisphere, we haven't had a, yeah, a really good... Yeah. So nobody's that, taken... That was mostly down south. And so when you were looking at the pictures, like we were looking at those pictures of Neowise, they were, they were some of the most fantastic pictures of comets that have yeah. ever been taken. And it's and it was a, a mediocre comet. comet. Yeah. I can't yeah, wait so. <laughs> for a good one. It's going to yeah, blow our another, minds. Another, and it's weird. Hayukutaki and Hale Bop came by in rapid succession. It was like, it was like really spectacular comets were just like common in the late 90s. Yeah. It's like we took them for granted because yeah. we had been waiting for Hale Bop for like a year or two. Yeah. And then Hayukutaki just came out of nowhere. Yeah. I actually liked Hayukutaki a little better because it just came up out of nowhere. Yep. And it was, uh, it was really spectacular. Yeah, it's a good time. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Carolyn, let's talk about uh, a rogue planet. Yeah, so actually um, in the late 90s, I was working on the International Halley Air Comet Watch, and so I was looking at all kinds of pictures of comets, saw exactly what you were talking about, which is this big switch from, from film to digital. And this last Neowise, I was just marveling at these pictures, wish, you know, wishing these people had been around when I was doing all the research in, in grad school. It was pretty cool. I, I remember the argument that that digital would never overtake film back in the late nineties. Yeah. A lot of a lot of astrophotographers would say film is real astrophotography. That people are just playing around doing digital. Yeah, they don't say that so. anymore. <laughs> yeah, they don't. All right. So um, last week was the D Division of Planetary Sciences meeting, and of course there was a lot of news about planets. And the SETI Institute came out with a with a statement about um, based on Kepler and Gaia data, and there's a connection here. I'm going to get to okay, it. Okay. Okay. That they estimated there were about 300 million potentially habitable worlds in the galaxy. Now, of course, we've seen these estimates come and go. I mean, I just saw one today that there could be five billion habitable planets in our galaxy, and our galaxy has 100 to 400 billion stars. So there's there's some a lot of estimates about how many are out there. But if we focus on the census from Kepler and Gaia that said that SETI did, they're talking about um, this idea that we've got about 300 million worlds out there that are potentially habitable. And some of them are fairly close to us within like 30 light years of, of Earth. So that got me to thinking about, well, 
if there's some, they're really close to us, they're well within our radio, uh -oh. you know, radio and TV uh, emissions that are spreading out. So these people, if they are out there and, and these worlds are inhabited by intelligent life, they may very well know about us. And now we're spamming them about our election. <laughs> right. So no, didn't they cool. say, I, I know in the, in that report, they said something like there was like a 95% chance of there being a habitable world within something like 30 light years. I forget the exact yeah, yeah. numbers and distances, yeah. but, but really close that. And yeah, then, they didn't say how many, but they just, yeah. you know, or they, they sort of intimated it was like a dozen or yeah. It's something like, something you know, like within yeah. 10 light years, there's like 10 yeah, yeah. stars. And yeah. then within a hundred light years, there's like 10,000 stars. And so yeah. as, yeah. you know, as you get into wider and wider distances, there's many more stars and you're going to oh, have yeah, these yeah. these habitable worlds. Um, so what does that mean for searching for evidence of life? Well, I think some of that has to do with, you know, once we know that they're out there, we can start trying to spot those worlds and using all of the techniques that they have been. And the next step would be then see if we can look at occultations of these planets, you know, of their stars by these planets to see if we can get light coming through their atmospheres so we can look for the chemical signatures of life, which I know we're going to get to about phosphine in a minute. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, but looking for things that, you know, that we know life emits or exudes or whatever you want to call it. Um, you could do the same thing with Earth. I mean, if somebody's within 10 or 30 light years of us, they could take a look at us and hope and see if, if Earth when it when it when it occults the sun, you know, when it transits the sun, they can try and see what what emissions in our at, are in are in our atmosphere that would indicate the presence of life. Yeah, um, and whether it is from like looking at the planet, looking at the at the infrared signature, looking at it in the visible spectrum, looking you know yeah, doing yeah, looking yeah. at the chemicals in our atmosphere to try and sense yeah. different chlorofluorocarbons and and other things, and yeah. of course listening to us as you say through the radio waves to hear. <laughs> our air traffic control and and old television shows so yeah it kind of reminds me of of abby Loeb at, at harvard said you know we could be looking for their battle radars too yes you know, because though you know if you stretch those out you can actually see them you know if, if, when the signal stretched out yeah yeah um he's got quite an interesting idea about that yeah he, uh, there was something uh fairly recently about that that he, he published yeah 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 oh he keeps coming back to it he he first wrote about that like 10 years ago or a little bit more and and he was suggesting it and now that we've got a little bit you know more sensitive equipment and some some methods for looking you could certainly look for that uh, because he thought radar would be something that would get out if everything if everybody's gone digital you still have to if you're in battle transmit things right it's not always going to be digital so. yeah 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 so anyway. so that's the that's the first part of the story yeah and then well let's get to so, the second so of course part we of have the these populations of planets that aren't earth-like you know those are the the hot jupiters and the neptunes and all that but but what about the rogue planets now you know we've had these rogue planets kind of floating around and we've talked about them we've heard about them and there hasn't been a lot of detail about them but last week there was a discovery one announced by scientists using the optical gravitational lensing experiment, which has the great acronym of OGLE, O-G-L-E. <laughs> and the OGLE program, it's actually been around for about almost 30 years. I knew the, the founder of it is Bodan Pashinsky at Princeton, um, who unfortunately died a few years ago. And they've been doing observations all along. Right now they're shut down due to COVID, but um, but when they when they do these things, they're using optical telescopes to look at stars and track the flickers of starlight that might happen when a closer object either obstructs it, transits it, or or maybe does a microlensing event. So you see this little dimming as it crosses across. And those flickers can actually also come from, you know, if the star flickers and there's no known planets around it, or if maybe they're not in the line of sight of us, uh, it could mean that something has passed in front of it and done a little bit of a microgravitational lensing effect. So that's what they were looking for. And a team from the University of Warsaw observed a microlensing event of a star, and they came to the conclusion that the only thing that explained it was this rogue planet wandering through space between us and the star, and we happened to have this line of sight view of it. So they measured the microlensing effect, and it was it was like the shortest one they've ever um, measured. is like 41 and a half minutes long. And so from that short period, they're able to work out the probable mass of the planet, which they think the mass and size, which I think is somewhere between the mass and size of Earth and Mars, so somewhere between those mm -hmm, two. Mm -hmm. And it's thought to be wandering the galaxy far from its distant planet star, but I don't, parent star, 
but I don't think they figured out what the, that star is. Well, so I mean, there's so. two sources of of formation of these of these rogue planets. There's right. there's the ones that could, that could get ejected from star systems, right? And then it's also possible that these things can just form in place, and just out of stellar material, but just have less material come together to form a smaller object. Well, that would explain the small the smaller mass and size. Of yeah, them. yeah, and and yeah. the. And based on some of the surveys that they're looking at, it's theorized that there could be as many of these rogue planets as there are regular planets in yeah, the in yeah. the Milky Way. And a, and a thing that's really interesting about this is that when we imagine future civilization, you know, the future of humanity attempting to cross the distance from here to the nearest star, if you could locate some of these rogue planets they would they could serve as as way stations on the way from world to world because they are going to have all kinds of resources and in fact you know and Alex I'm sure will be able to have some opinions about this that you could have one of these you know a giant planet see a Jupiter world with a bunch of moons orbiting around it and they would through tidal interactions actually have fairly like Enceladus Europa like Mm -hmm. conditions on them that's surprisingly warm um, that was exactly what i thought about too when i was reading this and i was thinking you know way stations or could we be searching for life on them and, and it's not as dumb of a question as you might think um but to think about it i mean it's sort of an ap academic ex exercise it's wandering in space so even if there's one or two of them like a, you know as you say there can it have life? Could it have life? And and the, the big answer is if it's just this solitary rogue planet, probably not. I mean, it doesn't have any sunlight. There's no warmth. Probably, you know, it's not in any habitable zone. It's not in a Goldilocks zone. If there was any life on it, well, first you have to ask, when was it ejected? If it was ejected so early from this planetary system that life didn't have time to form, then, then that sort of answers the question. If it was ejected a little bit later and maybe microbial life had a chance to form, it's going to be hidden under whatever layers of ice or, or if the atmosphere collapsed or something like that on this world. But, but that kind of was the thought process when I was reading this thing about yeah, this yeah. wandering, solitary, lonely, lonely guy out there. Well, could it have life or could we use it? And that was the next step I was going to move to was, yeah, we could use these as way stations or whatever if, you know, when we actually are out there wandering through yeah. the galaxy. Alex, so that was a, it was kind of an interesting story. Alex, you've done a lot of work with the Kepler data. Do you have some, some opinions about the, about this survey? Did you get a chance uh, to see it? Wait, sorry, the, is this the, the Ogle survey? survey? We're, we're no, the Kepler, the, the, so the, Ke the Kepler survey. So oh, NASA oh, yeah, published yeah. that gigantic uh, yeah. piece of information about Kepler about doing these habitable planet mm -hmm. estimates. I don't know if you saw it. Them. Yeah, I didn't really take a close look oh, at it. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 no, no. I so just were... came out late last week. So. Yeah, uh, so they were just uh, talking uh, about the number of, mm -hmm. of, like, just how many habitable worlds are probably out there. Based, they did sort of statistical analysis. It was a huge group yeah. of researchers. It was something like, right? You know, it felt like the Kilanova scale number of cast people of thousands. worked yeah. on this yeah. on this paper, yeah. sort of crunching down all of this data, but. Um, right. What do yeah, you, I think that the right. Go ahead. Oh, go I was going to say. So, like, you know, I mean, f what do you think about exomoons as a habitable candidate? That totally throws the numbers even higher, wouldn't it? <laughs> Potentially, yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know we're always interested in what the, the moons in our solar systems can tell us, for example, and and uh, obviously we think some of these moons are are interesting places to look for life. Uh, the question is whether you could have something very Earth-like is uh, as an exomoon. I think at least in our imagination that seems very plausible, and uh, and there has been some work to say that you know you could have something like that, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I actually no have question. a question about that. If you had a rogue planet that is ejected out there, at, and we don't know how old it is, but let's just say it, you know it's maybe not even as old as Earth, um, what are the chances of it still having some sort of radiogenic heating from the interior that might keep things habitable? Or right, useful? yeah. That is, right, just as you were saying that. I mean, we've been talking, we'll talk in a minute about uh, life potentially in the, in the clouds of Venus, and it, this is sort of uh brought up the question of uh, you, you know a much older idea about life in in an atmosphere like jupiter for example so yeah, yeah. I, I would think uh you know a, a terrestrial planet like you've been uh, talking about obviously going to be very cold and dark maybe not a great place to look for life going to be very unlike venus because you know venus's heat 
comes largely from the sun and, and the greenhouse effect, of course. Uh, but if you had something like a, a, a Jovian world or, or something like a, a brown dwarf, you know, it seems like you get to a certain altitude and now you've got very uh, temperate climate and potentially, uh, you know, reasonable atmospheric uh, pressure. So it seems like, you know, I, you know, I'm very much out of my element, but it seems like yeah. in that sort of situation, you could potentially even have life. In a, a from from like what that. I'd heard, um, if you've got a thick enough atmosphere and you've got the, <clears throat> the, the radiogenic heating that you were mentioning, that it actually can maintain a fairly comfortable temperature for a long period of time because there's just a lot of heat being put out. And if you do have that situation where you've got a, you've got a, um, uh, you've got a, like a, a giant planet like Jupiter and it's, and these, and these planets are orbiting around it, then, I mean, we see with IO, IO is covered in magma because of the tidal yeah. interactions. And so there's clearly a lot of energy that's being driven by these interactions with Jupiter. And so if you can sort of strike that perfect balance and at the same time, if it, you know, I don't know there's, whether you would have the same kind of captured magnetos, you know, magnetic field that's so dangerous. So I don't yeah, know. It's yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's here's ideas. Regard, yeah, here's ideas. Sorry, Fraser and uh, uh, sorry, uh, based on what New Horizons saw at Pluto, even with the geologic activity, that there's some yeah, kind yeah. of heating still going on there too. So. Yeah, that was sort of the road I was going down when I started to read this, and I I, I was wool gathering a lot of ideas about it. But, yeah. Um, the one thing that I that I thought of is well, once you remove the star, that's going to remove an important source of heat. But what if you know what's the compensation? And I don't want to take too much longer, but that was just a real fascinating yeah. thought experiment. I, I I think that over the next couple of you know the next few years, there's going to be more and more emphasis on these rogue planets. People are going to realize they play a bigger role like there's they're more common there's more of them out there <clears throat> they're more fascinating than anyone ever thought and i think it's going to be and they could be closer than anybody thought chances are the and they closest... also give you a really good chance of looking at another aspect of planetary formation that we hadn't really studied yeah before. Yeah. So, um, yeah but you, they need to be within about a thousand au for us to be able to use them yeah. with existing technology be able to just detect them like in the infrared so they need to be very close for us to be able to see them. So unfortunately, it's planet it, nine distance. That's yeah, crazy. yeah. It's and like, the problem with those lensing. with Warm those outer, gravitational yeah. lensing is it's just one mm -hmm. and done. You just you see it and then it's yeah. gone and then yeah. you never yeah. see it again. <laughs> so it's Aww. it's like, it's got to feel so bad to be those those gravitational you know micro lensing researchers are like we found a planet and we will never know <laughs> anything else ever again. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's mostly, you know, it's going to be a, a statistical tool, right? Yeah. And this is what I've been thinking about in terms of finding moons. There's been, been a, you know, a couple of papers about finding exomoons through microlensing. You know, obviously we're sensitive to those kind of low masses, um, but, you know, it's going to be much more valuable as building up a statistical picture. We can't, as you say, follow up uh, any single object. Yeah, yeah. You know, Wait for it to that. cross in front of another star some, some <laughs> other day. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Carolyn. All right, Alex, you're on my screen right now. Let's uh, let's bring let's make everybody sad. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, yeah. Oh, let's let's make everyone sad. That's uh, that's what this world needs right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. So we're talking about phosphine. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, regular viewers are familiar with this story. Uh, phosphine potentially in the uh, atmosphere of Venus. This Life on Venus. Right, so that was how the media obviously got covered, and you know, it, it, it's, the paper I think was a little more circumspect about it. But um, I think some of the very same authors on this uh, on this big Nature paper said, you know, phosphine is potentially interesting biosignature. Um, it's really hard to explain if you see it somewhere um, in certain contexts uh, without a, a biogenic explanation. And so they went and they were looking for this uh, bi biosignature on Venus. Uh, I think the paper says initially just kind of as a proof of concept that they were worth looking at Venus with the uh, James Clerk uh, Maxwell telescope. And they thought, hey, we actually see some something here. It looks like we're maybe actually seeing a, a signature of, of phosphine. So they followed it up with ALMA, right? And uh, with that work, they said, we think we see the same uh, signal. They claimed a 15 sigma detection, I believe, of this uh, absorption of, of, of phosphine. So that made a big splash, especially because of this uh, uh, potential that this is maybe a, a signature of life in the Venusian atmosphere. Um, of course, with any big 
uh, result like this, people are going to come along and check. Uh, I was having flashbacks to my own uh, work <laughs> with the uh, yeah. exomoons in, in some ways because, you know, a big result demands really uh, a skeptical eye and people coming along and trying to reproduce uh, what you're claiming. And so people uh, did come along. Uh, there was a first paper came out that said, we've reanalyzed uh, old pioneer data uh, examining uh, Venus atmosphere. And they said, yeah, we do actually see support yeah. uh, for this hypothesis. Um, so that got people kind of excited. It's a very short paper. I don't even think there was any plots in there. So it was very short kind of like, yeah, we looked at the pioneer data and, and, and we believe this phosphine detection. Uh, and then two other papers came out more skeptically. Uh, the first saying, we've looked at this, uh, been looking at Venus since 2012 uh, in the infrared. And, uh, and so this is a different wavelength regime. But phosphine, like so many molecules, it has a variety of lines um, that are show up at all different uh, wavelengths. Hmm. And so if you see something in one wavelength, and it, I mean, if it's really there, uh, put, you know, maybe you ought to be seeing it at other wavelengths as well. So they looked at it in the infrared, and they're saying, we're really not seeing this at all. And they said they, that they put a stringent upper limit on the uh, abundance of phosphine in the Venusian atmosphere, which was like five parts per billion. That's uh, four times lower than the abundance uh, claimed by the initial team. And not only that, but they're, they're not saying we see five parts per billion. They say that's a upper limit. That's right. a three sigma upper limit of four times less abundance. And then a subsequent paper came out and said, yeah, actually, it has to do with the way that you fit out all of these uh, systematics in the data. Radio or uh, uh, millimeter, submillimeter observations, they can be very, very tricky. I did some uh, radio work uh, very early on in my career. And uh, indeed, these molecular lines are incredibly challenging to, to handle. I say I was having flashbacks to the exomoon. Uh, work because similar, you know, you see a molecular line, you see one big line, and you've got all this other kind of stuff going on right. in the baseline. It's kind of like a light curve, honestly. I mean, some of the same uh, ways that we deal with uh, systematics are going to be some of the same tools that people are bringing to this otherwise very different problem, but uh, handling the data is not entirely dissimilar. And they said, yeah, you know, the way that you fit out these systematics and even the way that the Alma pipeline. Uh, reduced this data uh, to begin with, they see some problems there. And, and that's what I heard contra- as well. Yeah, go right? ahead. I heard that the that the Alma pipeline has a problem with the with the way that it processes this kind of data. Right. So this is a little outside of my element, of course, but uh, th- this was uh, the assertion is that uh, that you know, depending on how you calibrate this data. Um, and actually observing a, a, a disk, you know, like, like Venus is in itself evidently rather challenging um, in this uh, wavelength regime. Um, so it turned out, I mean, I, even ju- I just saw this on Twitter, but then Alma issued some sort of uh, retraction of the data, which has seemed very unusual hmm. that, uh, that the data sits out there. I mean, it's like Hubble, you know, you get a Hubble observation, that Hubble's data sits out there yeah. for all time. Anybody can go use. through it. Right. So... For them to come along and say we're pulling this data offline because there's a problem with it, uh, really uh, struck some people as very unusual and even sort of problematic uh, in some eyes because you know other astronomers want to get their hands on the data and actually try to understand what's happening with the data and, and see if they can reproduce the null result or reproduce the positive result. Um, and uh, and then there was a paper honestly that came out and everyone was was quite upset with the initial yes. abstract. Uh, because it basically demanded that the initial nature paper uh, be retracted. I just pulled it up yesterday, and that sentence has been removed. Oh, it I think has they got sufficient. Yeah, oh, I think okay. they got sufficient blowback from that from that language that yeah. they have. Uh, I mean, it was uh, like they've, like they've we, since revised it. Yeah, they said something like, "We demand that the researchers retract and mm. and." apologize i forget what exactly what yeah. it was but it was just right like, yeah you know. it was pretty strong language yeah and everyone it really was, was kind of shocked about it um so you know so this has really raised a lot of uh, uh, important questions i think uh, for one thing you know the nature paper has tons of authors the original paper i'm talking about went through you know 
uh, three peer reviewers, presumably in nature. Meanwhile, these uh, subsequent papers that have been calling it into question, they haven't been peer reviewed, right? They go out on the archive, uh, they're under review, presumably, but they haven't been reviewed yet. So this is controversial amongst astronomers, whether or not you should put something out before it's gone through a full peer review or not. Um, you know, questions about how this gets covered in the media, right? It's a very sensationalist result and, uh, and people get very excited. And then, you know, it's not two months later and we're saying, hold on, it's not actually <laughs> real. Yeah. I think it sort of, you know, can serve to undercut people's uh, uh, faith in us as uh, scientists. Uh, the difficulty of frontier science, right? I mean, you know, scrutiny is part of the game. I was talking, of, you know, I had a lot of sympathy for the scientists because I said, you know, doing this hot, you know, this this kind of uh, high profile science is a little like walking on a tightrope. If you had all the other tightropers trying to knock you off, um, you know, that's how it feels. And it's a really high wire yeah. act to, to get yeah, out you, here. I mean, you kind of went through this claim. personally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Similar sort of uh, situation. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, my takeaway from this is, uh, well, for one thing, we need respectful disagreement when we disagree. Right. Uh, this is this is how science goes. Right. We're going to come out. Somebody's going to make a claim. Somebody's going to test that claim, uh, contest that claim. And uh, and, you know, the name of the game is that we're all in this together and we're all trying to find the truth. So we have to do that respectfully. Um, molecules are hard. Radio is hard. Yeah. Molecules are really hard. I got out of radio in no small part because you could never be entirely sure that someone wouldn't come along and yeah. say, you know, I'm pretty sure that that silicon uh, 11 to 10 transition is is uh, the explanation for this so-called new phenomenon that yeah. you're finding. <laughs> you know, they're just really complicated stuff. Um, but hopefully, I think the conversation has steered towards uh, we uh, collectively agree that we want more in situ uh, exploration yeah. of Venus, especially Venus's atmosphere. Um, that conversation has really ramped up in the last couple of years. And I, you know, I think at the very least, we all support uh, going back to Venus and, and understanding more about this planet. It's a fascinating place. Yeah, Venus is a chronically underexplored world. And Agreed. when you know, the poor Japanese Akatsuki spacecraft is like the only one that's there taking pictures alone. You know, hello, anybody, right. anybody, you know, every now and then, a, you know, a spacecraft flies past Venus and takes a couple of pictures while it's using it as a slingshot um, right. is is deeply unfair. And there's some really wonderful ideas for missions, both both orbital uh, and in, as you say, in situ into the atmosphere, as well as even ground, some really cool ideas for ground based missions that could try to explore using really innovative yeah, ideas. I, I really love the airship idea. Yeah. Would, you know, just yeah. let's let's yeah. throw a dirigible yeah. up there. I mean, so Rocket really Lab wants to send one up pretty soon. Like in a couple yeah. of years, Rocket Lab already has a, a small Venus mission, an idea for an yeah. atmospheric mission. Yeah. I like the, the clockwork rover that NASA wanted to do a few years ago. They were talking. That's really intriguing. It's like, just how would that even for co doing communications and and everything, how that would actually work is really intriguing without yeah, putting any they, electronics on it. They did a, um, a challenge. They did a, a, a couple of years ago to do, like, come up with as many ideas as possible for yeah. technologies that would work in the, in, at the surface of Venus. And, you know, we're going to see some really neat ideas come together. So then, Alex, what do you think then about, like, is this a learning experience for scientists? Did, did, did somebody do something wrong or is this just how science works? Uh, yeah, I don't think people have uh, done anything wrong per se. I, you know, lots of scientists on this initial paper. Uh, I, I, you know, I read the paper. It's, uh, I think they've done their best to try to turn over every stone. Um, you know, they say, you know, we tried to rule out uh, all kinds of other molecules, you know, they do uh, sophisticated modeling of what's happening in the atmosphere. They try to rule out other systematic effects in the telescope, for example. I really do think that they did their due diligence. Um, and, you know, when you have a potentially very exciting result, and it's uh, only natural that you want to, uh, you know, tell people that it's a potentially exciting result. You don't want to bury it under the, 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 you know, the covers and say, well, you know, phosphine, maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if you think it matters and you think you found it, uh, you're going to want to uh, tell people that way. At the same time, 
people uh, rightly are coming along and questioning this potentially very important result. Um, and this is how we do science, right? So yeah. as far as media coverage is concerned, it's always going to get blown up uh, with, the, with the flashiest possible angle. And so as scientists, I'm, you know, I think we always have to be aware of that and to, uh, you know, just uh, be as circumspect as we possibly can yeah. and do our best to communicate the findings accurately. And, um, and, and, you know, after that, it's a little out of our hands. Once it gets out on Twitter, yeah. people are going to make of it what they're going to make of it. Yeah. And uh, you know, we only have so much control over that. I, I want to see Venus penguins. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, from my perspective as as one of the journalists, right? I mean, it's our job to to report on this news and right. and to I mean, we always run this this really careful line between communicating the value of the science and the exciting developments that are being made, but also using all of the right weasel words to put things into context to make sure that people know whether this is really rock solid or whether this is just an interesting hypothesis or, or whatever. And, right. um, you know, obviously with Universe Today, we have a ton of experience and we have a lot of reputation on the line. And so we're a lot more careful about this kind of thing than some of the mm -hmm. other people who just say, oh, <laughs> you know, there's a you know, NASA just discovered an asteroid that's worth uh, 60, you know, more than the world's economy. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so having having had one such a, a, a work, I suppose, that uh, that uh, got a lot of media attention, I've still got a Google alert for every time someone says anything about Kepler 1625, I get an email. And so I get to see literally everything that gets said about it, including the most outlandish, crazy stuff. And yeah. there's a lot of it out there. So, you know, Universe Today and, you know, there are definitely some some great uh, science journalists that I've worked with uh, over the years. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of great journalism out there that, as you said, does gets it just right, you know, really reports it yeah. the, uh, accurately. Um, but there's, you know, at a certain point, it just gets out the door and there's no controlling yeah. uh, the wild uh, stuff that gets said about this stuff. So, and I think it's, I mean, I think that we as human beings need to have this flexible openness to just the possibilities of nature for someone to go, here's something interesting. And, and for you to kind of take that on provisionally and say, okay, I'm open to there being life on Venus. Let's look more. And then being, you know, like, oh, there wasn't life on Venus. You're like, okay, well, you know, what are you going to do? Maybe there's Mars. Who knows what's out there? Um, <laughs> right. And, and like, I think that, that we suffer from, from people being so fixed in their mindset and, and, and this process of science to see how science changes its mind, to see how science is continuously looking for whatever is the overwhelming evidence to support an idea is a really healthy way to look at the, at the world. And so it's like you need, it's like some tough love, I think, when, when you go like, we used to think this and now we don't think that anymore. And that's just, that's fine. Like, be flexible in how you perceive totally. the world. And I, and I, I have no problem when, when that happens. And I, I sort of enjoy changing my mind. I enjoy seeing more evidence and, and coming up with a new idea. So I think this is great. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of us were out there tweeting, this is the way science works. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you get yeah, people totally. saying like, you know, you told me there was life on Venus and now you tell me that there isn't, and I can't trust anything that I ever see yeah, about anything. Yeah. No, that's not how it works. I thought it was pretty nifty. They they were actually looking at Venus for like the baseline for a sterile world. They weren't looking for phosphine. You're talking about the original uh, yeah. Greaves paper. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you're right. Right. Yeah. 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 They were just looking. This is the bait. They said Venus is it's obviously right as a benchmark. Like, a that's right. Benchmark that's right. to say yeah. this is what a sterile right. world would look like if we were right. looking at an Oops. exoplanet. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. that's that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 yeah, not so much now. <laughs> All right. Well, we've reached the end of our of our episode. Uh, Dave, you wanted to give one quick update on uh, on Osiris Rex. Yes. Um, yeah, Os Osiris. They did manage to store the sample that they they decided to forego the spin test because they were when they took the tag sam head and they looked back after they sampled Bennu and they used the sam cam and they took a look into it. They saw material was coming out, so they think they were actually over successful. Uh, the consensus is that they probably collected 
in the excess of hundreds of grams of material, which is well over the 60 grams that was the baseline for the mission. So they decided they're going to stow it early and they, the stowing mission uh, maneuver was successful and it's coming back in 2023, but uh, overall it looks like it was pretty successful. Yeah. And we were talking about Hayabusa 2 is coming back uh, December 6th. That's coming back just in a month from the Japanese asteroid sample mission. So we're that's coming right up. We're going to see that. Finally, we'll have more than just a couple of grams of an asteroid. The first Hayabusa had shards. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's really an interesting when you read the mission, how um, really they they had a lot to overcome on that mission to get anything back. So it was <laughs> yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. All right, well, Dave, you're on my screen right now. So why don't you tell people what you're working on and where they can find out more? Um, frequent contributor, Universe Today, doing mostly observational what's in the sky type stuff. Uh, sky Telescope, I do the space flight beat as far as what's going on for planetary missions and things like that. And of course, I have the first book that was out years ago, Universe Ultimate Guide to the Cosmos. And the new book came out a few months ago, Backyard Astronomer's Field Guide. And um, I don't know, I have some ideas for a third book probably, you know, it's a, uh, it's quarantine. So there's, I've got plenty of time to write. So, uh, in the meantime, just doing a lot of news articles and going up on the roof with the telescope. So. All right. Well, uh, let me know if you want some ideas. We'll brainstorm. I got I a have bunch a few. of ideas too. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Carolyn. Uh, I just got a note from my publisher saying, we'd like you to work on another book, but they haven't said what it is yet. So I'll have to let you know. I just finished off a, a show about exoplanets, which is why I've been diving into them. Uh, just narrated it and it's being mixed as we speak. Um, and that's kind of it right now. Oh yeah, I just finished off a campaign in the election for a local issue and it won. So I'm pretty happy about oh, that. Oh good. Wow, local yeah. politics at work. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Boy, don't ever let me run for office, please. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what are you working on? Well, I just uh, arrived here in Taiwan, of course, so I'm ramping up my independent uh, postdoctoral uh, research. So uh, I'm working on exomoons, of course, still. Uh, I've been interested recently in trying to understand more about these systems when we're looking at multiple exomoons. Uh, for the longest time, it's uh, been, a, you know, we've just assumed a single moon around a planet, basically for computational simplicity. And uh, and that, that helps us in a lot of ways. But... Uh, uh, but you know, if we look at Jupiter and Saturn and yeah. Venus, we see a bunch of bunch of moons. So um, I've always been a little uncomfortable with how much we rely on the single moon framework, and so I'm delving a lot more deeply. So you're going to try to see the, what uh, seventy moons looks like. What happens? What multiple moons? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> not seventy, <laughs> a few at a time. <laughs> right. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm going to put everybody back on the screen. Um, uh, We've got uh, next week, I've got some interesting interviews. Actually, Chris Carr from actually he's in two weeks from the Weekly Space Hangout. He's going to be my guest on Open Space. So I'll be sort of digging into his background and find out more of it, more about him. Uh, this week, I've got Peter White from uh, Not Even Wrong blog. He's a particle physicist and he'll be talking about the future of particle physics. So we've got a lot of cool interviews coming up on uh, on my YouTube channel. So check that out. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Thank you to our moderators. Thanks to Nancy Graziano, as always. Uh, everybody on both Twitch and YouTube and my co-hosts, thank you so much. And we'll see uh, all the, wa the viewers next week and then my co-hosts at a random configuration in upcoming weeks. Thank you, everybody. Bye. So long, folks.